what is going on what is going on as you can see today we're going to be going over the volkswagen phaeton um unfortunately i had to restart the uh stream so hopefully you guys can see that so basically what we're going to be doing is the volkswagen phaeton today as you can see uh what is the volkswagen phaeton well it was a uh well, I'm mad I had to restart that stream. I lost those likes, but you know, stuff happens. What is going on, y'all? Uh, Volkswagen Phaeton, though. If you're not familiar with what a Phaeton is, I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of people have never even seen one in their life, and um, that's because they only shipped about you know 2,500, 3,000 of them. The numbers are debatable to United States. This would be Volkswagen's first attempt at a super flagship sedan. Obviously, they have Audi, and Audi has the A8, but this one was on a different level than the A8. This one actually provided the platform for the Bentley Continental GT and the Flying Spur. This came out before them. So, the success of those brands, um, if you want to look at those as successful cars, which I think they are, because uh, although they are pretty unreliable in terms of their value on the, the aftermarket, in terms of their sales and their contribution to the luxury car space they really can't be matched shout out to clean whips in the chat what is going on man but as you can see this car looks very similar to a passat and a lot of people do confuse them with passats but they are full-size luxury sedans um you know equivalent to like an a8 size we'll get into the differences between this car and the a8 and why this car is way more special than the a8 but of course, we'll also get into why the car didn't sell too well, because you're probably wondering if a car that's this amazing um, with all this, you know, technology and it was at the forefront of this class. Why didn't it sell only 2,500 units and you never see them on the road? We'll get into it in a minute. I just want you guys to get a feel for this car. Look how luxurious the inside is. Mind you, this is a 2005. So, you know, you got to keep with the times, you know, in terms of what you can think of as comparable equivalents in the market 2005 was a interesting year this is uh something I, I wanted to show just a unique feature of this car the vents actually when you turn them off they disappear so very cool one of the many unique features of this car we're just going to take a look at another one this one is in blue instead VW badge makes it look like a big Passat. I know. I know. That is the one reason why this car did horrible. Is because of that badge. But we'll get into it in a second. But. It's hard to tell on these videos. But this car has some of the smallest panel gap tolerances. Ever seen on a production car. The build quality on the Phaeton is unmatched. But again. When you have a car with low production numbers, no matter how good the car is in 20 years, if you can't find parts, then what good is the car? You can see. Very understated design. Again, not many people will even recognize this car as different than a Passat or even a Jetta. Let's see the interior. The interior on this car, I mean, we just saw it, but very similar to a Bentley of the time. Of course, this was the platform for the uh, Continental GT and the Flying Spur. So, as you can see, this one has airbag lights and a traction control light. Or I don't know what that light was, actually. Anyway, that's kind of it. We'll pause this and we'll get into it. What is going on, y'all? On Warren Car is back again with another car buyer's guide today. As you can see, we are going to be going over the Volkswagen Phaeton. In the United States, the Phaeton was only sold for two years or three years, 2004, 2005, 2006. And then they canceled it because no one wanted to buy it. Um, in the rest of the world, it was sold, I believe, uh, up to like 2016. But I'm not too sure, to be honest. <laughs> that's not my realm. I don't know what the cars do when they're not in the United States market, unfortunately. But in the United States, we got this car for three years. Didn't sell too many in terms of numbers and 
the biggest reason why was not because it was a bad car, was not because the ethos of the car and the way it was set up was not focused towards, well, I guess that is really what it is, honestly. Basically the badge. It is a Volkswagen. It was an upmarket sell. Basically the Volkswagen company, Ferdinand Pieck wanted to make a car that competed with the S-Class as well as the Lexus LS. He, in his mind, the Audi A8 was more of a performance sedan, so it competed with the 7 Series. But yeah, so this one was supposed to compete with S-Class, Lexus LS, but it's still a Volkswagen, so people really didn't buy into the brand. But before we get into all that, let's do some quick announcements. If you haven't already, join my Discord. All you have to do is hit the link in the bio. It's free. I don't know if people think it's like a paid Discord or something because no one wants to join it. Um, it's free. And not only if you join, or not only joining is free, but if you join, you are eligible to win $54 for free. And it's it's literally nothing. All you got to do is hit the link. Um, well, I do ask that you do some things. I, I ask that you like the video, comment below something about the video or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Subscribe to the channel and share a video with somebody. You can either share a video or you can share a reel. I have reels on my Instagram page, um, on my TikTok as well. I don't really use the TikTok because I kind of got tired of uploading so many different platforms, but I really need to get back on it. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the channel is starting to show this first signs of growing a little bit. So I'm going to take advantage of that wave and try to just start really putting out my content on all these different platforms to take advantage of the new people that are coming to watch. So if you're new here, what we do is uh, we go over the features, options, and problems for a specific vehicle. Well, for the buyers guys, at least we go over the features, options, and problems for a specific vehicle. Then we look at the ads on Facebook, Auto Trader, Car Gurus, and we see what we can find. What I focus on here mainly is specs. So we're going to go over all the options available with the car, and then we're going to be able to point out, based on pictures alone, what car has what specs, and then we can price them accordingly. I don't know who else does this right now on YouTube, but I do it live. And yep, we're going to go through all the little details, all the nitty gritty stuff um, with pretty much every car that I go over. So if you like that, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button if you haven't already. Shout out to the five people in here right now. What is going on? What is going on? If you haven't already, hit that like button. And I already said it, but subscribe too. Cool. Let's move on to the features, options, and problems. Um, let me bring up my sheet real quick. I got I got a good amount of lore for this one just because it's not really a car that... You know, there's not too many examples out there on the market, so we're not going to be able to... I mean, I found enough for the show, but it's still not as many as I'd like. Um, let's see. Let me just... Uh... Nope. Okay, we're all good there. Of course it does. Thanks, Paint. Cool. So... As I mentioned before, 2004 to 2006, hope you guys can read that. Um, those were the model years for the Phaeton in the United States. The Phaeton originally came out in 20, or 20, it came out in 2002. And I believe the production years, the, the production ended in 2016. In fact, let me just bring it up because I have the page here. No point in guessing on that. Yep, March 2016. And um, yeah. So production became began in 2003 and was the first appearing in North America in 2004. So um, it was introduced in 2002, late 2002, obviously with these things with cars, they introduced and one year later, they're, they're in production. And then usually a year later, they are in the United States market. Um, oh, let me read some of these chats real quick. Shout out to everyone in the chat. What is going on? What is going on? Um, Jacob said, but still it has a map. 2005 since then times have changed that's why i love these cars from the time because it is a time machine yeah parts um yeah parts are going to be really hard to find for this car we'll get into that in a second but yeah that's a big that's one of the biggest problems with cars like this they are super complicated and when you're when you design a car that's ahead of its time you know not only do so basically what happens is not only are the parts really expensive but not many people buy the car because it's so expensive and then that compounds into another problem where the aftermarket the used market 10 15 years later doesn't have any parts for their cars and i'm not sure they don't make like brand new parts for these cars anymore so your best bet is to find a rebuilt or a junk one and you know take parts over that but anyway we'll get into that in a second American sales ended in 2006. So what does Phaeton mean? So Phaeton originally meant a body style that doesn't have any fixed weather protection. So this would be like a horse-drawn carriage. That's what a Phaeton was. Over time, the name Phaeton evolved to mean just anything with like two axles and seats. So basically a car. So basically the Phaeton is a fancy name for a car. 
<laughs> so basically what Ferdinand Piek, so if you don't know who Ferdinand Piek was, he was the head of Volkswagen at the time. They had just acquired Bentley. And so they wanted to, as I mentioned, make a car that was a complement to the A8 in the sense that the A8 was the more sporty um, flagship sedan. They wanted to make a more luxurious limousine style um, luxury sedan. So they were going to have both of them at the same time, you know, not competing with each other, but filling different markets. As I mentioned, the Phaeton was going to compete with the Lexus LS and the S-Class, while the A8 competed with the 7 Series. More luxurious, more sporty, but they're all kind of in the same realm today, which is interesting. Um, PX had very specific goals for the Phaeton, and he didn't really publish the goals. There were about 10 different specific goals that he wanted to you know, see with this car. But one of them, or a couple of them was... <laughs> Even though some of these goals never came to fruition, which is funny, but this is just what he said. This is how ambitious he was for the project. He said it should be capable of being driven all day at 100 miles. <laughs> he said it should be capable of driven all day at 180 miles per hour with an exterior temperature of 122 degrees while keeping an interior temperature of 72 degrees. So basically, he wanted a car that was able to, first of all, be run at full throttle for 24 hours in like Death Valley temperatures while maintaining a 72 degree interior, which is pretty ambitious, pretty funny that that was his goal for this car, but that just shows how much effort was put into the quality of this car. This car also has a torsional rigidity of 37 Newton meters per degree, or 37, 37,000 Newton meters per degree. So I guess that's the amount of torque that is needed to twist the chassis by one degree. I believe that's what that means. They don't really explain that, but that's what I believe it means. And um, the electric motors that perform various functions of the car should be hidden for a cleaner look. Not really sure what that means because most electric motors are hidden. I don't know what, you know, application of electric motor requires it to be out in the open for it to be visible in a car. Uh, but anyway, these are the three things that he mentioned that he wanted to achieve with this car. Again, the car, I don't know if it can do 180 miles an hour for 24 hours, especially because uh, it's limited to 155. But with the W12 engine, you possibly could do that. I don't know if anyone tried it, though. Um, you guys can let me know in the description or in the comments down below if anyone actually tried that. So for this car in the United States, there are a ton of more options for engines outside of the United States. But today, of course, we're going to be focusing on the United States. It came with the 4.2 liter V8 paired with a 6-speed transmission and the 6 liter W12 paired with a 5-speed transmission. The, the uh, 4.2 liter V8 made 330 horsepower and 317 pound-feet of torque and the 6 liter W12 made 414 horsepower and 406 pound feet of torque. Obviously, the W12 is going to be the one everyone wants. You can get the 4.2 in a lot of different Audi and other Volkswagen products. So you don't really need. Well, actually, hold on. I don't know what other Volkswagen comes with the V8. I know they had the W8. Yeah, I can't think of a Volkswagen that comes with the V8, honestly, besides this one. Oh, well, a Touareg, duh. Anyway, so yeah, Volkswagen and Audi products. So the V8 is going to be a little bit more common, a little bit easier to service, a little bit easier to find parts for. However, it's just not as unique. You can get that in a bunch of different models. Um, the the 6-liter W12, you can also find in different models, but all those models are going to be very much more upscale. And of course, the W12 is such a special motor. If you're going to get one of these, you know, you have to get the W12 or else like, why are you wasting your time? As I mentioned, this uh, car was put on the D1 platform, which is shared with the Continental GT and the Flying Spur. The difference between this platform and the A8 is that this platform is all uh, steel and the aluminum, and the A8 is an all aluminum platform. So basically uh, that kind of goes with the luxurious way of thinking versus sporty way of thinking. A8 is aluminum, lighter, more performance oriented steel. We want more quality, uh, better build for the uh, Phaeton. Some other things, um, to mention about the Phaeton, over a hundred different individual patents were made for the vehicle. There's a ton of original stuff to, to come on this vehicle. Um, also, this car was one of the first cars to be equipped with draftless climate control. If you know what that is, it's uh, it's basically a climate control system where it tries to minimize the amount of wind that it puts in your face. So it kind of puts air in places where you won't feel it. So you gradually just feel the cabin getting cooler. It's more a luxurious way of cooling. Um, let's see what people say in the chat real quick. Clean Whip said, just getting back to the internet. Oh, well, well, congratulations on getting your internet back. I'm glad you're here. Um, Jacob said, oh, well, really, how to compare such Passat to the big German cars, Audi? Uh, wait, how to compare such Passat to the big German cars, Audi, cannibalism, BMW, and Merck? Um, I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, I mean, the Passat... Uh, Volkswagens are actually not that bad in terms of their quality. Like they're pretty nice, but they're not 
up there with Audi, BMW, and Mercedes in terms of how they're perceived. Um, but I'm not really too sure what that question is. If you could rephrase it, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, other things that are uh, specific to this car, besides the draftless four zone climate control, it has a torsion based four motion four wheel drive system. It has adaptive suspension with continuous dampening control or damping controlling, <laughs> damping control, um, skyhook suspension. So it was actually the first car to use a skyhook technology uh, for its suspension systems. I'm going to show you exactly what a skyhook, uh, what skyhook means in theory, because I was a little bit confused a bit about it as well. So just looking right here, you have your spring down here and you have your damper up here. I guess usually in a traditional system, the spring and the damper are located below the load. Um, but in a skyhook technology, skyhook, meaning that the damper is actually in a reverse fashion where it's pulling the weight back up instead of uh, cushioning its fall. If that makes sense. So that's what skyhook is in a nutshell. I don't know if that really makes sense, but that's what it is in theory. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that helped at all because it didn't really help me. I just thought it was interesting that they they talked about it like this. This is the sky. That's why it's called sky hook. And basically, it's like a hook. It's like holding your. It's like suspending you from the sky, basically. But the sky is a theoretical sky. It's not. You're not actually being suspended, but that is how it's supposed to function. I guess. Anyway, <laughs> moving back to this. Um, also, radar cruise control was standard on these cars. Dual pane windows as well. Um, as well as anti-fog glass. So this is really interesting. You didn't have to push any defrost buttons with this car or anything like that. Um, and yeah, just anti-fog glass, never fogged up. Unfortunately, due to the Volkswagen badge, they only sold around 3,000, probably even less than that in the United States. People didn't want to pay. It was 85 grand for the V8 and almost 130 grand for the W12. People weren't willing to pay that much money in 2005 for a Volkswagen when they could get a Mercedes, an Audi, or a BMW for cheaper than that. But people didn't really understand. The thing was, people didn't like the brand or the way it was packaged. But then when they got behind the wheel, people really, really liked the car. So, I mean, this car was mainly marketed to people that wanted to be super 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 low key but also have a really nice driving experience the problem is that you know america is not really that type of market people want to you know show off what they buy you know they don't want to be they don't want to spend money for nothing and you know most people who want to spend one hundred thirty thousand dollars on a car want it to be at least recognizable to the general public they don't want to be in something that no one actually knows what it is or confuses it with something lesser than what it is um Jacob said, the man, the name, you see the search for some Greek mythology. Yeah, uh, I was looking that up as well. Jacob said, you don't see such cars in Europe. Maybe that's a niche where they might be desirable in the future. Um, You know, it's funny that they sold most of these in Germany. So 19,000 of the 26,000 were actually sold in Germany. And I believe most of those are going to be sold with those smaller engines. It was available with, I believe, a VR6 and a smaller V6 engine as well. And even some of those had uh, manual transmissions, but they were only front wheel drive. So Germany got all these cars. I don't know where they're at now, but in the United States, I'll just forewarn you right now, all the, not all, but a lot of the examples you're going to find. Well, first of all, there aren't many examples to begin with, but on Facebook where they actually put a lot of junk cars, most of the Phaetons you'll find on Facebook are going to be completely trashed. They're going to be sitting in a field. They're not going to be running. And it's simply because of the problems we're about to get to in a second. So let's get into the problems real quick. And then I'll explain to you guys exactly why this car is so problematic for people to own. Um, let me, what is my doing over here? Let's bring this over here. So let me copy this. All right. Bold this real quick and then. Cool. All right. So first and foremost, you want to check for corrosion on the doors specifically, especially the lower trim of the doors. Hey, shout out to GJ Inferno in the chat. What is going on? What is going on? Shout out to everyone in the chat. First of all, if you haven't liked the video already, hit that like button. It really helps me out. It takes you half a second. And yeah, do that for me real quick. I'll give you a couple seconds. So, And then if you haven't subscribed too, my subscribers have been going up recently. I've got like a, kind of a lot in the past couple days. I'm trying to get to 1500 by my birthday. My birthday is May 5th. It is April 4th. So a month in a month, hopefully I can get 150 subscribers. That's very, very uh, ambitious, but we'll see. I think we can do it. Anyway, going back to the problems. 
first of all, you want to check for corrosion, as I mentioned, specifically on the doors and around the edges of things. So like wheel arches, doors, trunk lid, hood. You want to make sure that the paint isn't bubbling because that means corrosion is under the paint. And it's going to look really ugly and there's really nothing you can do about it besides repainting. Um, also, you want to check these lower trim moldings as well. They are not, I believe they like their actual trim pieces that are on top of the door panel. So in between the, uh, you know, water can get in there and corrode the door. So definitely want to check the lower ends of these doors. You also have the electronic vent covers, as I mentioned before, what I just showed you. Um, where is it at? Right here. These vents can fail, and that's like a big thing on these cars. If you want it to, you know, be perfect, you want to make sure that the vents are working. So again, something you, you, with this car is that you have to test every single system when you get one. And we'll go over exactly what systems come with what packages in a second so you know what to look for. You also want to check to make sure the windows work. The window regulator failure is a, you know, common issue with these cars. You know, you can't really fix it. You just have to get a new window regulator. They're pretty expensive, especially on, on older cars. You know, window regulators are not cheap. You want to check the keyless entry door handles. If the car has keyless entry, you want to make sure the door handles do respond to the keyless entry. Sometimes the door handles themselves can fail. And, you know, that's not cheap either. You want to check the door locks as well, because if the door locks don't work, the soft close function doesn't work. For these cars, I believe 2004 soft close wasn't the standard, but for 2005 to 26, 2006 soft close was standard. Someone can clarify that for me, but that's what I... Uh, that's what I went or that's what I found that the 2004 is income standard with soft close, but the rest did. If your door locks don't work, the soft close won't work. So make sure that the door locks work. And if the soft close doesn't work, you want to make sure that uh, the door locks work. So I kind of said that weird, but it's either you can check the, if the door locks don't work, that could either be the, so that could either lead to the soft close not working or it still could work. But if your soft close doesn't work, it's probably your door locks that aren't working or the soft close could be function, not functioning either. So two different systems, but they kind of relate to each other. Anyway, faulty blower motors. So for the HVAC system, you want to make sure that the blower motors work. You want to make sure that they blow nice and strong. TPMS failure as well. After like five or six years of TPMS batteries, they uh, tend to fail. So you're going to have to fix this TPMS problem. Yeah, DJ Inferno is correct. F that. Let's get to 2K. 2K by uh, my birthday. We have 30 days to get like 650 subscribers. We can do it. Uh, Jacob says, Piet's tried to get, I don't know, Piek, Piek? How do you say his name? Piek. Piek Strider. Is that his full name? Tried to get VW into the luxurious segment, but it didn't succeed after so many years. It's like a bargain, like a GT3. Is it a bargain like a GT3? Well, first of all, I don't know what GT3 you're talking about. That's a bargain because they're all super expensive. But <laughs> um, yeah, this is a bargain. I would say these are bargains. The problem is um, parts are hard to find. That's the only issue here. We'll get to that, though. Um, that's one of the things I listed here. Um, let's see. Broken trunk wiring harness this is also a big issue. This car comes with an automatic opening and closing trunk. And if you notice, well, if you see, basically, have you ever looked lifted up a trunk lid of a car with, you know, some systems They usually have like a wiring harness that goes from the trunk to the body and it kind of just goes in between. You'll see it there. That wiring harness due to friction or whatever, you know, years of age, it fails. And that can lead to not only your power trunk not working, but also your rear lights not working either. So if you have any of those problems, you want to check your wiring harness first. It's very visible. It's right there. And if it's working properly, it's, it's, it's um, recommended to grease it, you know, every so often like white lithium, I don't know what it's called, white lithium ion grease or something like that. The lithium ion grease, just, you know, spray the the, the, the thing because it's like, it slides in and out of the body, if that makes sense. So you want to just make sure it's lubricated. Um, seize windshield wipers. This is also a problem for cars that reside in, you know, bad weather areas or cars that just have been sitting for a while and you haven't used these functions. This is another thing with these cars. Um, you know, they're old already, so this is kind of counterintuitive to say, but you have to always be testing out every function of your car, no matter what car it is. That's how they keep, you know, in check and working. It's not like you're going to make your uh, your car like prematurely break by using your functions every so often. Some people, you know, they try to save their functions by not using them. I know Jacob said his dad said, I don't know if he was joking or not, but he said something like, um, I'm going to save my functions by never touching them. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, you definitely want to check all the functions because a lot of these are probably going to be broken. Let's be honest. A lot of these cars, I'd say like 90% of them are not very good in terms of condition. People didn't take care of them. They were not really well received in the beginning and low production numbers and um, the badge 
it doesn't really, you know, bring in new people to want to get into the platform. You really have to do a lot of research to understand how good this car is. So a lot of people aren't going to actually do that research. And um, yeah, I don't know where I was going. That I was going to say, so I was going to make the point that usually this leads to a car being super collectible in the future. However, I think this being overshadowed by the Bentley Continental and the Flying Spur, um, that's what is going to ultimately put this car into the grave is that people would rather buy a Bentley because after all, they're the same parts and, uh, well, not the same parts, but a lot of the same parts and the bad, the brand name is just way higher than the Volkswagen. Um, let's see, continuing down uh, also to do with the windshield wipers. It has two windshield wiper motors, which is kind of ridiculous. I don't know what other car is two different windshield wiper motors besides like a bus or something, but yeah. So basically if you have one windshield wiper motor that fails, the other one will still continue to work. So they'll be like going like this, like it'll be like crossing over one. It will just mess up your wipers. It just, it looks really stupid, honestly. So you want to make sure that both wiper motors work and they hopefully are in sync. It'll be one thing if it will be kind of annoying if like maybe they both worked, but one of them was starting to fail. So it was like, it was like going like like this, like they started because that's how it is on a bus. I used to drive a bus and that would piss me off. It was like the wipers were never in sync. They would just be kind of random. And um, yeah, it's because it was two different motors. So anyway, <laughs> you also want to check for leaks. So a big thing with this car and it shares this with the Bentley as well is going to be the uh, clog scuttle drains, which are deep in the engine base. So you have that say you lift up the hood and right below the windshield, you have that drain, that big plastic grid grill looking piece. Underneath that, there is a scuttle drain. It's like these little holes that are like this, and they get filled with leaves. And basically, if that clogs, all the electronics around that area get flooded with water, and that can lead to a lot of problems. This car already is known for having a lot of electrical gremlins. That is a big reason why is water leaks that get on different um, boards and control units. Uh, Jacob said, Omar, the biggest question is if the electronics are troubling, is the engine... if the Wait. The biggest question is if the electronics are troubling, is the engine a high mileage? Um, so I think what you're asking is that does the do the electronics um you know go bad with high mileage? I, I I guess you could say that. It's more to do with the condition of the car and if it was serviced often or if it was like cleaned out, like stuff like this. You want to make sure that the sunroof drains and the scuttle drains are uh, not clogged because water can ruin these cars. There are a lot of different sensors and electronic systems placed like randomly in the car because there are so many different systems. So it, you can have, um, I, I, what I want to say is that you can have, wait, I'm just confused. The chat box. I just realized the chat box isn't showing. Hmm. Oh, well, I didn't mean to do that. Wow, that is that's actually a problem. I don't know why my chat box isn't showing. Um, but I guess we're only on YouTube, so it doesn't really matter. The chat will show up on the side anyway. So uh, whatever. We'll just uh, you know continue with what we were saying. Uh, yeah, you just want to make sure. Uh, what, so what you're asking, basically, is is it due to high mileage that the electronics go bad? I would say no. I'd say you can find some low mileage examples that have been sitting for a while that probably will have bad electronics as well. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the front and rear sunroof drains. There are two sunroof drains. There's one in the front and one in the rear. Um, they said you can use like weed whacker cord so that, you know, plastic cord, you can run it through the drain and kind of clear it out that way for the front one. For the rear one, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to remove some of the interior ceiling panels to clear those drains. So just keep that in mind. Adaptive air suspension failure is also an issue on these cars. They all come with air suspension. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that Volkswagen air suspension is actually a pretty good system. It's not really like as bad as aromatic or other air suspension systems from this time. So you probably won't run into too many air suspension, you know, failures. But if you do, it could either be the struts or the compressor or the lines, obviously. You also have suspension issues in terms of the actual suspension components. So faulty drop links, upper control arms, wheel bearings. These are the three things that typically go bad on, bad on these cars. Um, this just comes with uh, age. So suspension issues are definitely due to mileage. The higher mileage ones are going to have more of these clunking and uh, suspension problems. So you want to make sure that you take this on a good test drive and definitely get a PPI on something like this. It's cheap, I know, and a PPI might be too much money or like you might not see the value in getting a PPI on something that's this cheap in terms of prices. We'll go over the price in a second, but they're pretty inexpensive when you start off. This is like same thing with yesterday, but in a, you know, this is like taking it to another level in the, in the, in the way I was describing the W221 S class is like a boat when you buy it in the sense that it's cheap at, fir at first, but you're going to spend 10% of the cost that you paid for it every year, just keeping it the way it is. That's not upgrading it. That's not 
you know, fixing any major problems. That's just maintaining it. And with this one, same deal. You're probably going to be spending probably 20% of the cost that you pay for every year just to maintain it and keep it in the same exact condition that you bought it in, not any better, which is uh, kind of daunting for a lot of buyers. They don't want to get into something like this. Um, another thing, the power steering line corrosion. So basically cars, again, that have been sitting in, well, sitting period or that are located in more rusty areas like uh you know the north places where they salt the roads you want to make sure that the power steering line is not corroded because that will just cause power steering leaks and then i've heard this this was back in the day though that a lot of people say you need a fate a fate and certified tech to work on these cars i'm sure it's uh, gotten a little bit more lax as time goes on in terms of you know a lot of people kind of pick up knowledge here and there about the car so you can find someone who's not necessarily a fate and tech to work on your car but you got to keep that in mind that very few people actually know and want to work on these cars a lot of people don't even want to do it simply because they know that the the repair costs are going to be way more than what the car costs like the repair costs are going to be the proportion of the repair costs compared to the actual cost that people bought the car is going to be so big that no one's going to want to fix like fix them anyway and they're going to get a hard time for quoting stuff like that like mechanics probably go through a lot when they when they try to fix these expensive cars like say like someone brings in like a mid 2000 745i right and they bring it to the mechanic shop they spent three grand on it and the mechanic gives them a ten thousand dollar bill like i'm that's probably happened so many times where people like just leave and then they don't pay the bill or stuff like that and now they're stuck with like a like a, a car that doesn't work stuff like that so mechanics don't want to deal with cars like these in general that's just a that's just a fact and then specific v8 problems you have the intake actuator arm so this is you know one of those volkswagen audi intakes where it has you know little flaps inside the intake that can fail um not only can those fail but also the actuator arms on the outside they can fail as well they're made out of plastic from the factory so um it sits right on the front of the engine you'll see these little arms and they just lead to inside the intake and they just you know they turn and they activate some flap or something inside there um very typical on audi you'll see these a lot on the intakes um, but yeah, those arms are made out of plastic. They fail. They make aftermarket ones, though. They're metal, and they should last a lot longer. And then another V8 problem specifically is going to be the cra cracked oil cooler coolant plastic pipe. So this is just a pipe that um, it's it's just hard to, to get to. I believe this is the pipe they're talking about. There's just one pipe, this coolant pipe, that goes around the back of the engine. If it cracks, you have to remove the engine. Um... That is a thing on a Touareg. I don't know, if, like maybe the hood space, the engine base space on this car is a little bit different, so it's not as complicated, but know that it's a coolant pipe and it's made out of plastic and it cracks. And not only is that coolant pipe really hard to find, but it's also really hard to replace. It's funny, my friend Ahmed, who has the Touareg, he actually ordered, he, I, th I don't know if he ordered two of them or he accidentally got two of them, but he just kept two of them. He kept the extra one. He never sent it back because he knows that like that part is super rare. He can't find it anywhere else. So parts like that, you know, little stupid little things are going to be really hard to find for this car. And that is one of the biggest reasons why they are so cheap today. But we'll see that in a second. And then finally, timing belt. Um, every other vehicle or every other vehicle, every other engine that came in the Phaeton had a timing chain except for the v10 the v10 uses timing gears which is pretty insane in fact i just want to show you guys real quick um v10 came obviously in other markets not in the united states market but it's the same v10 diesel that is seen in the tuareg um v10 timing uh let's see VW. So this is what the TDI V10 looks like. It's pretty cool. You can see it's um, just a whole gearing system instead of a timing belt or a timing chain. Um, this one's a Ferrari. So, I mean, this one looks a lot better. Honestly, Ferrari designed the timing chain system a lot better, but this is an Enzo V12 engine. Just to give you a visual of what a, um, a constant gear driven uh, timing system looks like. It's pretty cool. Hey, shout out to Jacob Black with the donation in the chat. Appreciate you, man. You know, Jacob Black is literally my biggest supporter. I appreciate you, Jacob. You know, someday I'm going to travel over to Europe and we're going to hang out, bro, and talk about cars because you have been here every day and I appreciate you. Um, Yeah. Shout out to the seven people in here. If you haven't liked the video, hit that like button. It takes half a second. Cool. So this is going to be that V10 timing chain, timing, timing chain, the gear driven system. That looks like this. Kind of hard to see. It's but as you can see, no timing chains, no timing belts. It's all gear driven. But for the V8, it is a timing belt system. And then for the W12 specifically, not too many problems with the W12. The biggest problem is finding parts and finding someone to work on it. Again, there are also some little problems 
you know, such as, you know, timing chain getting stretched. That's obviously, um, how do you say this? This is a consumable part on cars. You know, especially this age, you're going to expect the timing chain to have some problems after 20 years. So that could be the tensioner or the guides could fail. And then there was also an issue with the five-speed gearbox with this car. All the rest of the vehicles had the six-speed, but the W12 had the five-speed simply because it was a little bit more powerful and the five-speeds are more robust. And so you had uh, gearbox slash torque converter issues on high mileage cars, and they often um, are seen to have their, either the torque converters or the gearbox or both either rebuilt or replaced um, on the higher mileage cars. So I'm talking like 120,000 miles plus. Other than that, not too many problems on the W12 in terms of mechanical. Most of the problems have to do with the actual platform themselves revolving around uh, electronical system, electronical, electronic systems, as well as, you know, um, just like corrosion and um, yeah, electronic systems and corrosion, really. That's pretty much it. But let's get on to the features. <laughs> let's get on to the options for this car. This is where we can figure out what we're going to look for in terms of ads. And I'm just going to warn you right now, the not too many options um, for this car. The packages were very limited and the individual options were limited as well. However, that just means that most of these cars, you know, V8 or W12, all came pretty well equipped from the factory, which is a good thing. It means that you really can't go wrong when you're, you know, looking at these cars and trying to spec one out. I will tell you, however, there are some things that you need to get and uh, other things that aren't really as necessary. Let me see real quick. Packages. Let me just bold. Oh, well, that's not what I want to do. Bold this. I'm going to bold that. Comfort package. And then four seater package. And then technology package. And then after this, we're also going to look at a brochure as well. I'm not going to just, you know, bore you guys with text. I'll show you guys exactly how they describe the car from the factory. But in terms of, you know, the V8 options specifically, because the V8 was not as equipped as the V12. So the V8 had a little bit more optional options. Does that make sense? Everything was standard on the V12. The V8 had more options. So for the V8, you could either get 17 inch or 18 inch alloy wheels. You could also upgrade to the 270 watt 12 speaker sound system. Um, you could also get a choice. You have a choice of walnut, chestnut, myrtle, or eucalyptus wood trim. Eucalyptus was the standard trim for the V8. And then also electronic parking assistance. So this is going to be your parking sensors. Those are all options to get on the V8. For the W12, you could get 17-inch wheels. Um, if you wanted to, people usually option these for maybe like a winter set, you know, to get bigger, fatter tires on there. But the 18-inch wheels did come standard. You could also get walnut, chestnut, myrtle, or eucalyptus wood trim. I forget which trim was standard, but we'll see in just a second. Um, and also electronic parking assistance was also an option as well. In terms of packages, you only had four packages that were available. Um, and, you know, two of them or three of them were available for the V8 and two of them were available for the W12. I should have wrote this would be W12. Anyway, so we'll read them out real quick. So for the and the thing was, the thing is for this car, they don't actually put what the packages consist of. They just write the package name. So I actually had to go through each option and figure out which option because it shows you which it shows you the packages are available for this car or this car, meaning V8 or W12. And it also shows you um, different options that are available for the V8 and W12. So I had to like put like the puzzle pieces together to actually, um, you know, define the actual packages. So this is a first in terms of this information. It hasn't been seen anywhere else online. I made this information. This comes from me. And this comes from um, very hard research that I was doing earlier. So basically, the cold weather and comfort package comes with 18-way power adjustable driver seat, 16-way passenger seat, sensitive leather upgrade, leather-wrapped multifunction, uh, and heated steering wheel, rear outboard heated seats with AC ventilation mas and massage feature, and power adjustable lumbar, as well as an adjustable power head restraint. And then finally, it also comes with Climatronic with impact pressure control. I believe this means that it has the rear um, HVAC system. All cars came standard with four-zone climate control, however... A lot of cars, not a lot of them, but cars that didn't have the comfort and cold weather package came with uh, just a regular back seat with no screen and you controlled the rear climate zones from the front screen. With cars with the comfort and cold weather package, it came with a rear screen so you could control the climate zones for the rear seats in the rear seat area. So it's just something to think about. You also have the four seater package available for both V8 and W12. This came with 10 way power rear outboard seats, memory power, uh, memory, power adjustable headrests, rear control for the front passenger seat, as well as power lumbar, 
um, rear center console in wood with a display for the rear climate control. So this is going to be your four seater setup. So you're, instead of a bench in the rear seat, obviously you're going to have a, um, a center console for the rear seat that contains like armrests and controls as well as your rear HVAC. You also had the technology package. This included the parking assist as well as the power opening and closing trunk. And then you had the comfort package. This is different than the comfort and cold weather package because the comfort and cold weather package was only available for the V8. The comfort package was only available for the W12, even though the comfort package literally, um, yeah, it, it just takes whatever was in the V8 um, in terms of the rear outboard seats with AC and ventilation and massage and power adjustable lumbar and power adjustable head restraints and uh, puts that in the W12 simply because the cold weather stuff in the W or in the V8 package was already included in the W12. And that makes sense. So as you can see here, um, yeah, the biggest way to tell between the packages, if it has a V8 and it has the rear climate screen, it has the comfort and cold weather package. If it has four seats, obviously it's the four seater package. If it has parking assist, so it has parking sensors on the bumpers, that means it has a technology package. And if it has, um, basically if it has the rear seats, um, and the rear seat buttons and it is a W12, it has the comfort package. So we'll go over the actual brochure. So let me bring that up real quick. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Oh, that's not a brochure. Um, here it is. Let me just refresh this. Cause of course it never is loaded. You can see here a lot of good information. Um, you know, very clean. Very early 2000s looking brochure. We can see all the colors available here. So a ton of different colors available for the Phaeton. We have Luna Blue, uh, Nocturne, Aubergine. I don't even know how to say that. Um, Aubergine Black, Campanella White, Cacao, Cow Cow Gray, I don't know, <laughs> Luna Blue. What is this? Clavier, cla cla Clavier Lac? I thought this was a different color, but these all kind of look the same. Black, Silver Mirror, Bolero Beige. Silver Atmosphere is a custom color. These are all custom colors. So these are probably going to be your main colors. I'm not sure what Clavalac means. Clavierlac. I don't know. Anyway, these are going to be your leather colors. You have Sonnen Beige, Crystal Gray, Anthracite. Petrol is a custom color, and Navy Blue is a custom color as well. So you're really going to see the Sonnen Beige, like a black and like a gray. And then Wood Trims, Eucalyptus. Standard on the V8, optional on the W12. Walnut, optional on the V8, standard on the W12. Um, optional on the V8 and W12 and optional on the V8 and W12 for chestnut and myrtle. So walnut is going to be what you see on the W12. Eucalyptus is standard on the V8. And uh, these four options, though, are available. It's kind of hard to tell the difference between myrtle and walnut. Um, but, you know, it's either dark wood or light wood. You can kind of go with any of them. They kind of look the same. Um, but, yeah, I really, really, I would personally rather go with the dark wood. And as you can see, standard on the W12 is going to be the walnut, which is a more darker wood. Just proving that a darker wood is more premium. But um, yeah, let's uh, take a look at the specs. So as you can see here, the packages are right here. It tells you the packages, but it doesn't show you what's in the packages. It does, however, show you that the package is either available or not available. So available for the V8, not available for W12, available for both, available for V8, not W12, and available for W12, not V8. So I had to take all these, combine them with what is standard on a W12 and optional on the V8. So for example, right here, this 18-way and 16-way passenger power adjustable comfort seat thing right here, it is... Optional on the V8, but standard on the W12. So what package is standard for W12? It's either the cold weather or the technology. And so basically I had to figure out whether or not that was part of the technology or the cold weather package by process of elimination. And then basically I found out the technology package only includes two things. It includes the power trunk and includes the parking sensor. So everything else was part of comfort and cold weather. And also the fact that this included, um, uh, let's see. I mean, it had to do with comfort and climate, so I assumed that it was part of this package. But basically, I had to go through all these different optionals, see if they're both optional for both um, V8 and W12. It, you know, if they're in both, there's going to be a package that is available for both. So you can kind of see the logic I had to go through to figure out what was in each package. But as you can see, the W12 has pretty much everything standard. Whatever is optional is going to be the rear seat, uh, four-seater configuration, and um, parking assistance, basically. And then for the W or for the V8, um, yeah, you had a lot more optional things that were either included in packages or individually optioned. Um, yeah, that, that's it in terms of the options. There aren't too many things to go over. As I mentioned, this was a flagship sedan, so most of the features were standard with the car. So with all that being said, let's get into the ads. Where am I at? 
So moving on to our first example on Facebook. Actually, hold on. Let me reset all these pictures. That way I can actually, uh, you know, because I'm going to just warn you, like most of the ads look like this. They're, ter they're terrible. They're, they're really bad. Um, it's really hard to find a good one of these, to be honest. Most of them are pretty beat. And that is unfortunate. Um, that's good enough. Cool. All right, let's move on to our first one. We have a 2005. This one is going to be what looks like a V8 because you don't see any type of badging for the W12. And let's see what he has to say. V8 engine, luxury car. That is also how the most of these ads are going to be titled and wrote, written in terms of the description. Not much details at all, which is why I tried to get you guys familiar with the packages that we, we can identify them off pictures and won't have to, you know, go back and forth with the seller who probably doesn't even know much about the car to begin with. So looking at this one, we can see it's in terrible shape. We're missing parts of the front bumper. Not sure if that's like a headlight washer panel that's gone, but we also see a big dent in the front. Um, yeah, you'll see a lot of these cars are not in the best condition. As I mentioned, we can see this one has the comfort and climate package though, simply because you can see it has the rear, um, climate zone function. You can actually control the climate from the rear seat. You can also see here, you can barely see it here, but there is a plastic piece right here. And that is basically the bezel where the massage function sits and the rear heating and whatnot. So you can control your rear seat stuff. But as you can see, it is a silver car with the dark gray interior. You can also see that they installed an aftermarket screen, which is pretty cool. I mean, for this car, it might be a little cheesy because, you know, it's not as classy. Now you have this big, you know, ugly infotainment screen, but it does bring it up to modern times. As you can see, he has CarPlay and everything. So modern car, you can actually use it on a day to day. Um, you can see here how nice these front seats look. Not really the best pictures, but these seats are beautiful. If you ever had a chance to sit in these seats, they're some of the best seats. Um, but yeah. I, this, you know, this car, you know, it's pretty clean. It looks like a driver. How many miles does it have? 67,000 miles. V8 engine, luxury car, not much to say at all. You're going to want to look up the VIN. So ask the owner of the VIN. Look up every single option that it has. Right now, what we can see is that um, you can see it has a parking sensors too. So this car is equipped with the comfort and climate package as well as having the technology package. No four-seater package. And it is not a W12, so it doesn't have the comfort package, but it does have the V8 version of the comfort package. $12,000 they're asking. It's been for sale for 20 weeks, so no one wants this car, obviously. Um, 12,000, 67,000 miles. You know, that's not too far off in terms of what this car should be valued at, but as you can see, it is not selling. So what I would buy this car for, being it has 67,000 miles, but it is in pretty rough cosmetic condition, I'd be willing to go up to $7,000. Oh, clav clavier is a piano and very soft and problematic. What does that mean? What do, what do you mean piano? And it's soft and problematic. Hmm. That that just made me have even more questions. Hold on. Let me just look it up. Actually, we're gonna take our time and look up what clavier clavier lack. So yeah, you, you did say it was the. Piano or white, piano black finish or garnish. I'm I'm confused because you know I mean, it says that underneath a bunch of different colors. So Luna blue, like do you know what this means, Jacob? Why they put it underneath certain colors? Why these three have that written here? If you don't, that's cool. I'm just I'm curious. Anyway, for this one, $7,000 where I'd be at, just simply because the cosmetic condition is really bad. And um, yeah, nothing to say about maintenance or anything like that. Cool, moving on to our next example. We have another silver one. This one is going to be a 2004 with 120,000 miles. And let's be honest, this one looks a lot better condition than the last one, even though you do see some paint peeling here and some cracking in the lower grill. Um, it does look a lot better in terms of condition. We can see this one is also a... Uh, well, it looks like a V8 because it doesn't say W12. It usually says W12 here, but of course those badges could be removed at some point. But what I'm looking at right here is a V8 car. That's what it seems to me. Um, we can see in the interior, we have the uh, yep black interior. These seats look pretty good for 120,000 miles. What you'll notice is these early Volkswagens, the interiors hold up very, very well. So this one is very nice. As you can see, 120,000 miles, and it looks pretty much the same as this one right here. In fact, this one looks a lot worse than this one. So this one could mean, or this could point to the fact that it was taken care of. Let's see what we can see in the back seat. Um, we can see here, you can see the little button panel is really hard because a lot of people don't take the correct pictures when they put these up for sale. But we can see here, this panel right here, this is gonna be the uh, 
massage and heater controls for the rear seat. So this car does have the rear, uh, this car does have the comfort and climate package. Let's see what else. See what he has to say. Made after Bentley. This car is truly luxurious. Heating and cool leather seats, rear air conditioning, sunroof, nav, and lots of other options. Clean title, no dealer documentary fee. All right, so not really anything to say about this car besides that it is in good condition. We see some also some damage here as well. A little bit more damage than I originally thought, but not too bad, honestly. Especially given the mileage. This one has twice the amount of miles as the last one, and it looks, you know, pretty good. You can also see the vent is up right here in terms of the cover, so you don't know whether or not this cover is stopped working or not. You want to make sure that you figure that out simply because when the car is off, the vent should close. So I don't know why it's still open. Yep, as you can see, it's still open. It's open in every picture, so probably going to assume that it is broken. I don't know why they wanted to show the heated seats that bad, but they did. Um, yeah. For this one, they're asking seven grand, 120,000 miles. You know, that's pretty close, in my opinion. Honestly, it's in good condition. Um, all depends on the maintenance history at this point, but in terms of condition, it is in really good condition for the amount of miles. I'd say for me, though, given that there is no maintenance history, I'd be willing to go up to $5,900 for this example, being that it is 120,000 miles. Cool. Moving on to our next one. We have a V8 one. It looks like 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton in this purple-blue color. Eight-cylinder, it says right here. Uh, please ask questions rather than just clicking is the available message. Um, yeah, I guess this guy is a little bit more familiar with the car and he knows that people looking at these cars probably won't be as familiar as him. So he doesn't even like those, you know, generic questions. He want people to actually ask the real questions. It looks like, he, I mean, I'm assuming here, but he wants to sell to a car, a, an enthusiast really that, that knows what he's talking about. Um, so let's see, hands down nicer than the BMW and uh, Mercedes of the flagship model, the flagship models of BMW and Mercedes of the era. Yeah, uh, I do agree. This is a really a premium, premium vehicle. And it just sucks that no one really appreciated it at the time and probably no one ever will simply because it's not anything but a Volkswagen. We can see here it does have the rear climate control. So it has the uh, climate and comfort package. This is a V8. You can see that right here as well as the buttons for the seats down there. Let's see on the outside. Does it have the technology package? It does not have the technology package. No parking sensors in sight. So simply a V8 with the climate and comfort package. And um, yeah, no power trunk either do they show the trunk nope let's see what he has to say about it double pane windows make it very quiet and refined audi v8 4.2 and all wheel drive um 2000 imported in the us and it could be closer to 3000 actually um and then everything works new tires oil just been changed okay so i mean this guy kind of sounds like he knows what he's talking about in terms of the car so this one would be a little bit better it's simply in terms okay yeah actually Real quick, that coolant pipe issue I was talking about, it looks like the same issue is here. I believe you can take out this tray and have a little bit more space, but I know that coolant pipe that goes behind the 4.2 is a big problem. So anyway, going back to this, um, this one, it looks like, you know, the guy knows what he has. It's blue on tan, so it's not really the best spec, but this is kind of more of a, a yacht spec. This would be what I consider a yacht spec. So blue on a tan gray with the light wood interior. So it is semi-desirable, but, um, you know, it doesn't really say much about maintenance besides that it's running really good. So you want to make sure that you get all that squared away. Make sure you get the VIN too. Look up what exactly this car has in terms of options in 2004. So it might be a little bit different. The earlier models of the cars, as I mentioned, had a little bit different options, mainly due to like soft closed doors and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. For this one, um, they're asking $7,500. It has 119000 and it is in pretty good condition. I'm not going to lie. Um, not the best condition, but it is in good condition. I'd be willing to go up to... Um, I'd be willing to go up to $6,300 for this one. And that is based on the fact that I believe this is being owned by an enthusiast and the condition of the car is a little bit better than um, others. And you can see this pan. This, this lower bumper part seems to have a lot of different pieces. Like you have this middle grill piece. You have these panels right here. You have the covers for the headlight washers. You have this lower piece below that. So um, you really want to make sure that the car is in good shape cosmetically. Because I know those bumper pieces aren't cheap to replace. Cool. Moving on to our next one. We have a 2004. This one is going to be another V8 model. Pictures are kind of blurry. This is one that does not have the comfort and climate package, though. As we can see here, it does not have a screen for the rear seats, just a panel. Uh, also, as you can see, I'm mean, looking at the front. I mean, it has a non-leather wrap steering wheel. You kind of tell that because it's a little more shiny. What else can we see? Does it have parking sensors? No parking sensors either. So this is a completely base Phaeton. 
one of the most base ones we've seen so far. In fact, it doesn't have any options, not even parking sensors. Um, I don't know what wheels they are, unfortunately. They didn't really show the wheels in the brochure, did they? Mm. So these are the 18s with the 7-spoke. The 17s? Wait. You had the choice between the wheels. Let's just do this real quick. You had 17-inch. You had 18-inch. So these ones are going to be the 18-inch. But these ones also look like they're 18 inches as well. Not really too sure. Anyway, going back to this. We got, these. I guess they're 18 inch wheels. Whatever, there's an option. The wheels aren't too fancy on these cars anyway, so it doesn't really matter. The condition of this car is in really good shape though. Compared to the rest of them, we can see that the front bumper is in good shape. Nothing missing here. And there are no dents really. The amount of miles is not that great though. 145,000 miles are... 145,000 miles it has, which is a ton. I'm not going to lie. That is a lot. That is going to, you know, be getting into those high mile territories where you're going to have to, you know, things might not necessarily be broken now, but they will be very soon if they haven't been replaced yet. So keep that in mind with something like this. Lightwood trim as well. So yeah, pretty much a very base model Phaeton with the small engine and really high miles. So this technically should be the cheapest example that we price today. I say for me, 8,100 is way too high for one of these. 8,100, stupid expensive for this. I'd say with 145,000 miles and being a V8 base model with no packages equipped at all, I'd be willing to go up to $4,200. Cool. Moving on to our next one. We have a silver example. This one is also going to have the silver wheels. Let's take a look at what it is. V8 again. What, uh, what I... I think only about 500 of the cars in the United States of the 3,000 were V12s. So what you're going to see is a lot of V8s on the market. So um, again, I do think what uh, Jacob asks, V8 versus V12, rather the V8, right? Um, if terms of reliability and running costs, yeah, I do believe the V8 is a more practical solution if you just want to drive around and enjoy your car. However, for me, I want to get the W12 simply because it's a Phaeton. I want it to be fully loaded. When I get a car, like first of all, I have to get the top engine. Like that is, the, I don't want to get a non-top engine because I'm just going to feel bad about it. That's just me. If you, uh, you know, if you're fine with the V8, then get the V8. The V8 is a really good engine as well. Very smooth. But, you know, the V12 is just simply superior, but also it's going to come with higher running costs. This one also does not have the technology package. We can see no parking sensors. See the interior though. We have the black interior. I'm trying to see the rear seat. No buttons on the rear seat either. So no packages on this car another base version of the car with high miles as well are these the same car 145 145 no this one is shiny wheels and this one's in fort lauderdale while well, this one's in north carolina same car same spec same mileage but different location this one is a little bit worse uh, condition as well. You can see the seats starting to flake and peel especially around the perforated parts and the perforated seats are like one of the worst uh like early model perforated seats i'm talking from like early 2000s no matter what brand they always seem to tear but simply because they're perforated they're like already meant to tear i mean if you perforate a piece of paper it's going to tear you know that's like the perforated edge where you're supposed to tear same thing with the seats they're perforated so of course they're going to tear um yeah so this one's in a little bit worse condition and you know the price is a little bit more appropriate but it is a really high mile base v8 phaeton i wouldn't really want to go above 3900 for this example right here Cool. And moving on to our last example on Facebook. We have our worst example. I don't know why I put it as last. Hey, shout out to you, Pez. I appreciate the support, man. Appreciate that. Like, I really do. Like, it means a lot that you guys actually can find value in what I do because I really enjoy it. That's why I do it every day. I stream every day doing different car every day. I don't know who else does it, but I'm really glad that people actually can appreciate it. So thank you, Pez. I appreciate you. This one is going to be 2005, 125,000 miles. All the maintenance has been done. New alternator and new batteries. So this car does have multiple batteries again. Another reason why it's really expensive to maintain. Only issue is a cracked front window. Um, that's also a problem. Another problem looking at this car is it looks like it's been hit on all sides. I don't know what's going on. You can see the paint right here on the fender is not very even either. Um, you know, it's mostly the rear that has the problems. You can see these wheels are those bigger wheels. I'm not really too sure. I guess these are the 17. No, they can't be the 17s. They look huge. I'm not sure what wheels these are. Anyway, looking at the interior though. We can see what we can get there. This car is really rough, y'all. I wouldn't recommend getting this at all. You can see it's, he took pictures of it like up in the air. Is it up in the air? It looks like it's on some jack stands or something in that. 
You can see the seats are also in horrible condition. This guy got into it like with, you know, keys on his hip or something or something like that. He didn't really care about the condition of the car. Neither did the passenger or maybe they're putting boxes in there or something. I don't know what you, this car is used for. It has a ton of miles, so it could be used for anything. Ton of different wear items on this car. We can also see the vents are wide open. So this vent system probably doesn't work either. Scrolling through, we can see this one though, it does have the rear seat package. So this has the four seating configuration. You have the rear climate control, you know, system right here, as well as a center, uh, center console for the rear seats. So pretty desirable. This one, oh man, did they show the entry bay? They did. Yeah, this one is going to be a V8. So V8 with the, so this one's going to be a V8 with the four seater package. Um, I couldn't tell. Well, I guess. So V8 four seater package technology package as well. Cause you can see the parking sensors. I'm trying to see it as the comfort and climate. Mm. One thing about this car is that it's, I'm trying to see whether or not actually let's, Let's see if a V8 can have the rear seat package and the comfort and climate package. Cause that's actually a good question that I am not too sure on because I haven't seen that configuration. Um, so you have a V8, you have the climate, the four seater package available for both V8. And so what is in the, actually, I gotta go back to this. What is in the climate and comfort package that isn't in the four seater package? So we have the, so basically the four seater package includes the rear upgrades for the comfort and climate package plus more. So you can't really tell that way. The only way to tell if it has the, basically the leather wrapped multifunction steering wheel, um, that's also heated as well. So looking at the steering wheel, <laughs> basically the only thing that can tell basically if it has the comfort and climate package just off of pictures anyway, is the steering wheel. And I mean, it looks really shiny. I don't know if it's leather wrapped. It looks like, I mean, it has some sort of stitching on it, but I can't tell if it's a leather wrapped steering wheel. You have to see if it had that function or the heated function as well. But obviously it has the rear uh, seat package. So it's not going to be like a base car. On top of that also has a technology package. So you can kind of assume that this is going to have that climate package, comfort and climate package as well. The only problem is this car is in horrible condition. And yeah, it doesn't really look like it's been cared for at all. It's sitting in Florida and Miami. And so you already know that this car has lived a really hard life and I really wouldn't recommend buying this $125,000 though for a V8 with the rear seat package as well as technology package. I'd be willing to go up to $2,000. Cool. All right, let's move on to auto trader. The next place we look at ads. Mind you, there are only about 10 for sale on auto trader and car gurus combined. So I'm going to do my best. I only have a few ads here, like nine of them. I brought up the ones that you could actually tell the packages because a lot of them, they also don't show the interiors that well. Like they don't show different things that I'll be able to tell which package it has. So it's kind of not, it's, po it's pointless to actually show the car, this ad, if it doesn't actually have any information. So moving on to this, our first ad on Auto Trader with some nice pictures, actually. We have a 2004 Phaeton. This one is going to have the V8, 75,000 miles. This one is in really good condition. We can see it's on the chrome wheels and is in this blue color with a black interior. You can see how clean this car is. This person really took care of this Phaeton, the engine bay clean as well. One of the cleanest ones on sale right now. No blemishes or anything on the interior in terms of wear on the seats. You can also see this vent is closed, so it probably is actually working. Very nice. You can see how clean it looks right here. We can see though, this car does not have any rear seat options. So no climate and comfort package on this one. It does not have any rear climate control um, screen and it doesn't have any of the functions to control anything for the rear seat. So this is a 2004 with no parking sensors either. So this is a base model, no climate and comfort package, no rear seat package or no four seater package and no technology package here. However, this is one of the cleanest ones you'll probably ever see. And so if you want something like that, you know, this would be a really good option for someone who wants to get a Phaeton, but doesn't want to, you know, put up with as much problems as possible. They want to minimize their problems with their car. And so this is it right here. We have a base Phaeton, low miles, perfect condition. And uh, they're asking 13 grand for it. I think this is a little bit too high for something like this. I get it. It's really clean. It has low miles, but for me, it's still, you know, going to have Phaeton problems at the end of the day. And when you hit hundred thousand, you're going to be running into some problems that are really expensive to fix. So I really would want to minimize my initial investment into the car. I'd say for being this clean though, it does deserve some credit. I'd be willing to go up to 10 
thousand dollars for this example just because of how clean it is one of the cleanest ones you'll probably ever see cool moving on to our next one we have a w12 our first w12 phaeton as you can see here it says w12 right here it says four motion w12 hard to see but it is there scrolling through we can see it is in silver another thing i guess to tell the difference between the w12 is the quad pipes so keep that in mind as well interior is going to be that dark black interior as we can see, it's not the darkest wood. I don't know what wood trim this is, but it is not the darkest wood trim available. Uh, scrolling here, we can see it has the rear climate control. So it does have the comfort package. Actually, now that I think about it, I believe that all the, all the W12 Phaetons came with the four zone climate control in terms of the rear screen. I believe that's the case. I believe that's the case. This one also has the parking sensor, so technology package as well. Hold on. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. The technology package was not available for W12. Um, basically, the technology package has the power closing trunk as well as the electronic parking assist, which could be a, an option or it could be an individual or it could be a package option or an individual option. So the W12 has it as an option only, so it is equipped with the parking sensors as an option. Um... In terms of four zone climate control, you can see that right here. Uh, where is that four zone climate control? It's standard on both. However, I'm talking about the rear screen, rear climate controls and display for passengers. Yep, standard. So exactly. So this is standard. So not really anything going on with this car in terms of extra um, packages. It doesn't have the comfort package and it doesn't have the four seater package. So it is a base W12. So we're, so we're, so what we have right here is a base W12, no rear comfort package. No four-seater package. Everything else is standard on the W12, so you really didn't have to equip anything else. The only thing this does have optioned is going to be the parking sensors. So base W12 with parking sensors. 91,000 miles, and they want $16,000 for it. You're going to find that these W12s are going to go for probably about double that the V8s go for in terms of, you know, what they're asking. I'd say for having 91,000 miles, but being a base V but being a base W12 without any rear seat package or even the comfort package talking about, you know, the rear seat stuff. Being a base W12 without the four seater package or any of the rear comfort package stuff, I'd be willing to go up to $12,500 for this one. I think that's a good deal for something like this. Um, but again, it's a lot of money to invest in something that you know is going to have problems in the future. Cool. Moving on to our next one. We have another V8 model. This one's going to be in black. As we can see here, no parking sensors on the front, but this is a very clean example. You can see the body is in really, really good condition. Nothing going on on the rear either. You can tell it is a V8 because it has dual pipes and not quad pipes. Interior is also very clean. We have the beige interior, the light beige interior with the, uh, I don't know what wood trim this is, honestly. It's a light wood trim. You can also see it has the rear um, you can also see it as a climate and comfort package. This is a V8, so that's what it's called. It's called the climate and comfort package. If this was a V12, it would be simply called the comfort package, but this one is called climate and comfort package because it comes with this climate control screen. The W12s come with this standard. So we can see here climate and comfort package, no technology package, unfortunately. So it is a V8 with the climate and comfort package, but climate and comfort but climate and comfort package only, no technology package, no four seat package either. Um, pretty good spec in my opinion, in terms of what it is. And, you know, given it's in pretty good condition for the mileage, what I'm trying to say, 124,000 miles and it is black on tan and it looks really good for that mileage. I mentioned this before, but these early Volkswagen interiors hold up very, very well, especially this being a flagship model, you would expect that. But yeah, you can see 124,000 and nothing more than just some cracks and creases in the leather. Anything he has to say about it? Nothing. Yeah, I had more to say than him. Anyway, 10 grand he's asking, 124,000 miles. It is a V8. It does have the rear. It is a V8. It does have the climate and comfort package, but it doesn't have technology package. I'd be willing to go up to $7,300 for this car. This is a nice one. I would agree. It's it's clean. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of the, the beige interior, but it's not bad. It's very clean in terms of condition, and it has the rear uh, seat stuff, so that's a big plus for me. I think that, it, you know, I'll go over, you know, what I would look for personally when we finish, but just, you know, to preface that, I would have to get that rear uh, seat stuff, the rear, uh, rear uh, massage, the lumbar support, the heater, as well as that rear screen. You need all that. 
cool moving on to our next example we have a 2004 w12 with some horrible initial pictures these pictures are horrible like i don't know who took these but they are really bad i know the pictures these ones aren't as bad but another black on beige with the light wood trim again this is a w12 so it's going to come with a lot of stuff standard we can see here the vent is open not a good sign it might mean it doesn't work you're going to have to want to you know clarify that it has uh the rear climate control but again that is standard on the w12s they don't show the rear seats unfortunately in terms of the buttons which is you know I had to include this because it was a W12 in good condition, but they don't show the rear seats in terms of the buttons. So I don't know if it has the comfort package for, uh, so I don't know if it has the comfort package off the bat. That is something you'd have to look up. That's something, you know, I mean, we have the VIN here, right? No, we don't. I thought, oh yeah, we have the VIN. Let's actually take a look. Let's see what they have to say. I doubt they would even talk about it, honestly. Like, it's hard to tell, honestly, but. Oh, come on, man. Bicycles. Okay, there we go. So equipment, let's see what this has. Um, let's try to find rear. Power, rear manual, side seat. Rear, vents, foldable rear, rear center console. Yeah, I mean, I don't see anything about the uh, lumbar in the rear seats or anything like that. Yeah, so I don't I, I do believe this is a base level W12 as well. So nothing to say about unless I just can't read. Does it say anything about lumbar? No, how about this one? This one I know is a no? Yeah. Oh no, this is a V8. Anyway, so I don't believe this car has any packages. I do believe that, that exam this example is simply a base W12. However, that's not bad because base W12 still come with a lot more than a base V8. So base W12 is, you know, equivalent to a pretty option V8. The only thing we're missing here is the, um, the rear, uh, oh, it does have heated rear seats as well. So yeah, I do believe that this has rear, rear heated seats. So it's going to have the comfort package. So not a base W12, excuse me. I didn't mean to say that, but yeah, so you have the rear heated seats. Let me just make sure and clarify that comfort package. Rear outboard seats with AC ventilation and massage. Oh, no, they all come. Wow. So I, I have to double back on that. What I just said, I believe all seats come standard as heated, but the AC ventilated seats uh, point to a, a, um, a rear seat or a comfort package for the W12, which they don't want to show. So we're just going to assume this is a base W12 and they want a ton of money for this one. Gosh. 30 grand, almost 28 grand they're asking for this one. 59,000 miles, and these pictures are horrible. Whoever listed this is doing a really bad service for themselves, not doing or not doing justice for their ad at all, because this looks horrible. Um, let me see if they have a Carfax. Let's look at the Carfax, see how long it's been for sale. Vehicle offer for sale. Yeah, so this car has been for sale since, you know, the beginning of December. November 28th, so what is that? December, January, February, March. December, January, February. It's been for sale for four months. So basically, just a quick thing. If the car has been for sale for more than 90 days, usually dealers, especially dealers, they want to move their cars. So they're able, not able, but they're more willing to make a deal. So if you find cars that have been for sale for more than 90 days, three months, um, definitely use that to your advantage. Be like, look, I know that you've been sitting on this car for a while and I know you need to move inventory, so let's make a deal. And if they know that, you know that they're in that position, they're more likely to make a deal. He said, if the picks are bad, then the price is good. Nope, the picks are bad and the price is horrible. <laughs> For this one though, being a 60,000 mile W12, it doesn't look like it have, it has the comfort package. I'd be willing to go up to, I'd be willing to go up to 15 grand. I can't go higher than that. 15 grand, half this price. But again, it might be in really good mechanical condition, but they don't really say anything about it. So they get the slap. Anyway, moving on to our last ad on Auto Trader, we have a 2005. This one is going to be a 12 cylinder uh, silver on black car. As you can see, I don't know why that was their first picture, but it is the first picture. We can see it right here. Horrible pictures for the car, but it does look like it's being for sale, like a private sale. It's in someone's garage. See W12 here. See also the quad pipes, silver on black, 
really clean executive spec we can also see this one has the four seater package so w12 with the four seater configuration very very desirable what else can we see here not much oh they wanted to show the four seater configuration of course so what we have here is a w12 um i believe it has the comfort package because it has the rear seat uh configure I believe it has a comfort package because it has the rear uh, four seat configuration, but that's something you'd have to clarify with the owner. 140,000 miles with this, ton of miles. You know, it's in really good condition though. I'll give it that for the amount of miles, but a ton of miles. You want to make sure that something like this is in really good mechanical shape because if it's not, you're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of high mile issues and there are a ton with this car. So I really wouldn't recommend getting a high mile W12. But if this one checks out mechanically and has everything done to it in terms of, you know, being fixed, then, you know, you could potentially, you know, score with this one in terms of getting a good deal. However, 140,000 miles and being a 2005 and they're asking 18, that's way too high for me. For me, being that this has the uh, four seat configuration, I would be willing to go up to $14,000. Cool. And moving on to CarGurus, the last place we look at ads. We have a 2004. This one is going to be a Phaeton Premier Edition. So I guess this is one of the cars that, you know, debuted the Phaeton in the United States. We can see it's on some aftermarket wheels. I don't know if they're aftermarket or just from another Volkswagen product, but they are not for a Phaeton. We can see it is a black example. I do like black. We can see it also is a W12 because it has the quad exhaust. See here, W12 6.0. Not bad looking in my opinion. The wheels don't look bad. Um, Wow. Wow. Was in the wrong place um let's see we're looking for interior pictures and we can see here interior is going to be that beige interior 106,000 miles on this one you can see this vent is open but the car is on so you never know whether or not that vent works you're gonna have to get that clarified this one has a, a lighter wood trim not really a fan of the lighter wood but it is what it is you can also see it has well i mean it's a w12 so it's going to have the rear um, it's gonna have the rear screen, but they don't show the bottom of the seats. That's annoying. Why wouldn't they do that? <laughs> well, so they don't show whether or not the car has the comfort package or not. Let's clarify what that is. Again, the comfort package rear outboard seats with AC ventilation, massage, power adjustable lumbar and power adjustable head restraints. So, um, yeah, I can't really tell. Can't see. We can see the headliner is sagging a little bit in the back. That's also going to be a problem with these cars, especially, you know, high mile ones. This one doesn't have that high miles, though, 100,000. So kind of getting up there. We don't see. Gosh, I wish they showed the, the bottom part of the seat. But, um, yeah, you, you don't see it. Unfortunately, nothing we can do about that. So we're just going to assume the worst that it doesn't have the comfort package. Um, 21,500 bucks they're asking for this car. It's a 2004 first model year, so I don't know why it's so high besides the fact that it is a premier edition, but who really cares? 106,000 miles. I say for me, being that this car is actually pretty clean for what it is, having 106,000 miles, I mean, minus the fact that the headliner is sagging here. Um, actually, they have the 360 view. Let's see if we can get a 360 view of the interior. Ah, oh, there's no 360 view of the interior. Oh, that's lame. I wish I could tell, though. I, I can't tell whether or not it's a comfort package or not. I mean, it doesn't look like it, honestly. I don't see anything here. But that's the way you could tell if it has the buttons. For me, though, being that this is a 2004... For me, though, being that this is a 2004 first mod of year Phaeton W12, um, you know, in a black on beige. So not the best spec, but it is very clean for the mileage. I'd be willing to go up to... I'd be willing to go up to 14.5 for this example. I don't think I could go any higher than that. 14.5 is where I'd be at for this one. It looks like it could have the comfort package based on how the seats look. I'm trying to see whether or not... Let's see if we can find a base one. What the rear seats look like. because It's called outboard seats. So the seats are a little bit different in terms of what they look like. But... Does this even show? Yeah, like, for example, these seats look a little bit different than... Let's try to find another example. This one's super bass, so it really shouldn't have any of the... 
course, of course, they don't want to show anything with the seat itself. That's annoying. Anyway, I'm going to, you know, try to find. Yeah, it's you can't really tell. It's not it. Nope. My theory was not correct. You can't tell unless you can see the buttons for the rear seats. And on these pictures, unfortunately, you can't. So for this one, 14.5 is where I'd be at. Cool. Moving on to our next one. We have a 2004 Phaeton W12. Again, this one has low miles, though. 85,000 miles, and they want 25 grand. You know, these Phaeton owners, they're really uh, very optimistic for how much they can sell these cars for. <laughs> Especially one with two accidents. Like, 25 grand? Are you guys serious? Especially, it's not even clean. Like, you didn't even really wash the car. Look at the interior, though. I mean, it's clean on the interior. I guess that it has that going for it, I guess. What else can we see here? Um... Sorry, excuse me, Dominion. yawn. What else can we see here? I mean, it's W12, so you're going to have these rear climate control panel. And, of course, you can't really see anything. Oh, you can, right here. There we go. You see the buttons? This is what we're looking for. And it does have the buttons. So this has the comfort package. W12 comfort package. Does it have, this <laughs> does it have the technology package? Holy crap, I can't speak. Of course, I can't tell. Can't even see it. Can't even see the trunk. If they show the trunk, it could possibly have that button, but can't tell whether or not it has the technology package or not. Do they speak about it? Wow. Rare one owner, 12, or W12 Phaeton. Recent timing chain service. Uh, nothing to talk about in terms of the packages or what it has. So I can't even tell whether or not I can maybe see some parking sensors here. So we're going to assume that it has parking sensors. We're going to assume this is a pretty much fully loaded minus the rear seat, four seater configuration package. This has the technology package. Actually, uh, I almost spoke again. The Phaeton does not have the technology, or the Phaeton W12 does not have the technology package. It can only be equipped with parking sensors because the trunk, auto trunk closing system is standard on the W12. So this car does have the parking sensors optioned as well as having the rear seat comfort package option as well. So pretty much as good as it gets without having the four seat configuration. This one, they're asking 25 grand for it and it has accidents and it's not even the best color combo. It is black on tan and it has 85,000 miles for me. I'd be around the, well, I mean, this one's pretty loaded in terms of what it has and it's in really good condition. I'd be around the $15,000 mark. Jacob said, Onwar, if you find the car that you want, want to buy, what is the cost you want to accept if the car is on the other side of the US? Um, So, I, Shipping probably will range depending on the car, depending on the car, I'll be from like 800 to like two grand, right? Two grand is probably going to be, um, you know, a more, you know, it can go way higher than that, depending on it, you know, if you want like an enclosed carrier or something like that. So if you're talking about that, I'm going to price the shipping in, but usually people who are selling cars, they're not going to like really go for that in the United States, at least like if you're on the opposite side of the country and you try to negotiate saying that I'm on the other side of the country, you got to, you got to take into consideration me coming over there. They're going to be like, eh, whatever. Like I got people that can buy it on this side of the country. So if I find a car that is on the other side of the country, I don't really think about discounting it from the distance. In fact, you know, that's just how it is. I really haven't thought about that ever. Like I really haven't thought about trying to put that on the seller. In fact, you know, I just try to get the best deal possible, but I wouldn't, take into consideration the distance really um but you know i i probably could use that as a negotiation tactic i just never have to be honest um you know usually when i find a car on the other side of the country it's specific it's like a specific car that i'm looking for and really the distance doesn't matter because i'm looking for that specific car and that you know price range you know that it's all perfect in terms of what it is so i'm just going to go with that um but yeah if I, found, if I like, if I'm shopping for a car and, you know, I have the choice between one that's really far away and there's one really close, obviously I'm going to go for the one that's really close, but that's pretty much obvious with anybody really. Anyway, 15 grand for this one. I do think that these are kind of overpriced. Um, granted it, it does have under a hundred thousand miles, but it is a Phaeton at the end of the day. It's not an A8L. It's not a Bentley. It is a Phaeton. And unfortunately they are the cheaper ones out of the bunch. Cool. Moving on to our next example. We have another one at the same dealership, but hopefully they took some better pictures. Um, is this the same car? I hope not. This one has 90,000 miles. This one has 85,000 miles. They're at the same dealership. They are... Uh, hmm. 
<laughs> this car has been for sale at this dealership. I think this is the same car, honestly. I think they just drove it around here. Actually, do they? Okay, the VIN 8228. Oh, this is 7993. So this is actually an earlier production car. <laughs> you know, it is a 2004 as well. So they have two of the same car, basically. Black on tan W12s. Um, this one has been for sale. <laughs> this one has been for sale for 1,919 days. Let's do the math real quick. 1,919 days. 1,919 divided by... <laughs> Wait. <laughs> divided by 365. It's been for sale for five and a quarter years, and they can't move this car. Five and a quarter years. How many months is that? Let's divide it by 30. 19, 19 divided by 30. That is basically 64 months. This car has been for sale. Not three months, 64 months. This car has been for sale for even longer. Or no, sorry, this car has not been for sale. I thought it said 2,500 days. 1,200 days for this one, 1,900 days for this one. So as you can see, it was priced at, the way it's priced, um, you know, has a direct correlation on if it sells or not. So this one has been for sale for six years. This one has been for sale for what? What's 1,200 days uh, divided by years? 12, 12 to 5 divided by 365. So this one's been for sale for almost three and a half years. <laughs> that is horrible. 281 saves. This one has... 515 saved, but no one bought it. That is crazy. Anyway, going back to this one, let's price this one out real quick. This one's also black, W12, interior is tan, a little bit more wear on this one. You can see the seats, a little bit more wear and tear. Light wood trim. See the vent is closed. Hopefully that means it works. Um, moving to the back, we can see it also has the comfort package. You can see the buttons on the seat. So thank you for taking good photos of the car uh, dealership. But, you know, unfortunately your car is not moving. So sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I laughed and burped at the same time. That's hilarious. Anyway. Yeah, looking at this car, a little bit worse condition, but, you know, they actually took some pictures of it. What are they asking? $21,000 and it has 90,000 miles. Yeah, nope, not, not a good price at all. And you can tell this car has been for sale for years. No one wants it. So for me, I put, I put it at, you know, I, I should have taken that in consideration with the last price. I said 14000 for this one. I'd be more like 12000 for this one and 11000 for this one. Like it's been for sale for that long. Let me have it at this point. Right. Like, no one wants it. That is clear. So, I said 11,000. Okay, maybe like 13,000 for this one. I'd say for having uh, I'd say for having 90,000 miles and being a 2004 W12 with the rear comfort as well as the uh, parking sensors. Does it have that? Wait. Hold on, hold on. No parking sensors. No, it does have parking sensors. I see them. So it has parking sensors. It has the comfort package. It has 90,000 miles. I'd be willing to go up to $13,000 for this car since be, simply because it's been for sale for 1,200 days. So wondering about the, uh, I don't know what the Servive is, and inspection after three years. I mean, in the United States, you know, cars can be sitting, if they're at the dealership, they're fine. You don't need to have them inspected. Um, you know, they're just sitting there. You don't even have to like, like dealerships, you know, get the privilege to not, you know, register cars and have cars sit for a while, and you don't have to do all that. Uh, but in terms of getting inspected, I don't know. Hopefully, because it's been at a dealership, like they've at least kept up on, you know, making sure that it's actually running and in good condition. Because you know, this is like a resident at the dealership at this point. Um, but yeah, the service and inspection after three years, you know, it's at a dealership, so you want to like give them the benefit of the doubt. They probably hopefully should have been maintaining it up to this point because it is under their care but again you really can't be too sure especially with dealerships like this they're not like they're just like a used car lot so you want to make sure that you know you do all your due diligence yourself get a proper ppi don't depend on a dealership uh to you know give it to you straight because they definitely won't especially on a car that's been sitting for three to five years you know they want to get rid of it and then finally we have our last example this is going to be a 2004 v8 all wheel drive so we can see here it's this like brown or not brown this is gray green color you'll see this like this color actually looks very familiar it's like i believe that a lot of like s5s and a5s came in this color too or it's like an audi color as well but now nah, that's just from the pictures i can't really tell see this one's a v8 because it has the dual pipes not the quad pipes interior we have the gray interior with the light wood trim we can see that this vent is closed right now so hopefully it works i know that's a big thing i always talk about um 
And yeah, this is a horrible ad because I can't even tell. Oh, we can see right here. It does not have the climate and comfort package. Um, horrible pictures, but no climate comfort package. And looking on the exterior, it doesn't have par it does not have parking sensors either. So in terms of what the packages that could come with, it doesn't have the first package. It doesn't have the climate and cold weather package. Climate and comfort. I've been calling it climate and comfort. It's climate and cold weather. Excuse me. It doesn't have the four seater package. It doesn't have the technology package. So no packages on this car. This is a base. Phaeton V8, first model year, base Phaeton V8. So nothing really fancy going on here. And in fact, you know, that should be a recipe for being one of the cheapest examples. How many miles does it have? 101,000 miles, so not too many miles. You know, it still has a good amount of miles, but not too many. It is a V8 base model. Um, so considering this mileage, the spec, as well as the condition, I'd be willing to go up to $5,800 for this car. How long has this car been for sale for? 78 days. So you can see a lot of these cars are, you know, they've been for sale for a while. How about this one? 242 days. This is ridiculous. All these cars have been for sale for almost three months or more. Um, some of them being almost 70 months. So just keep that in mind. These cars are not selling. So this is a buyer's market. If you... <laughs> yeah, this car is pretty boring. I'm not going to lie. It's boring to look at. It's not boring to drive and own. It's super, super luxurious and super like up there in terms of quality. But yeah, it's boring to talk about, especially the fact that they only made three model years and not really much to talk about. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that pretty much wraps it up for the ads. We got through them all in order to, su and to sum it up. I'd say you should look for a 2005 plus a 2005, or 2006. If you want to get a more reliable version, get the V8. It's going to be better on gas. It's going to be better in terms of reliability and maintenance. You're not going to have to spend as much in terms of parts. However, just keep in mind that other stuff that isn't with the, um, that isn't involved with the engine in terms of stuff specific to the D1 Phaeton platform, the stuff that's actually equivalent to Bentleys and whatnot, they're going to be really expensive for those types of parts. So keep that in mind. V8 or W12, it doesn't matter. Those parts are going to be expensive. Um, wouldn't recommend getting a first model year, obviously. I also personally would get a w12 simply because if you're going to be spending this much money on replacement parts for when they do break you might as well you know go all in and get the w12 it's going to be more rare it's going to have that street cred it's going to be cool and you can actually bring this to like a cars and coffee and get somewhat some recognition you know a v8 people are going to be just asking does it have the 12 cylinder you're going to be like no it doesn't have the 12 cylinder so get the 12 cylinder if you want something special um i do believe at some point these will be collectible cars i know it's hard to see right now but this is literally the bottom of the market well maybe the bottom of the market happened before the pandemic but we are in the bottoms of the market in terms of these types of cars in general specifically this phaeton is you know very well, first of all the makings of a car that uh well the makings of a car that's going to be desirable and collectible in the future are the following um it's going to be low sales numbers so low sales slash production numbers they didn't make too many of them to begin with you also had people not really liking it during its you know release it wasn't received very well and um also, just uh, just the general like non like people. If so, if something is hated by people originally, it should eventually be liked by like a it should have a cult following basically in the future. And um, I haven't seen that happen with this yet. Maybe it'll start to happen as more and more people talk about it. But uh, you know that's also a good sign because you can get these for really cheap. As I mentioned before, this is a buyer's market car, meaning that all the sellers have been selling for a minute now, and they're just trying to get rid of them. No one wants to buy these cars. So if you're one of the few people that find these interesting, which, um, yeah, as uh, Clean Whips definitely does not find it interesting, um, yeah, <laughs> then you can get a good deal on this car and be in a car that's equivalent to a Bentley. However, no one will care, and no one will give you the props that you deserve for it. Um, you know, just keep that in mind. No one will care about this car. Everyone will overlook it. No one will even look twice at it. So... As long as you know everything you're getting into, you're getting into a very expensive, very dull, um, very uh, like hard to maintain, hard to find parts, but kind of very high quality car. Just uh, this is the car for you. At least you know. But most people they don't they aren't comfortable with those kind of parameters for a car. They want something that has more brand recognition. They want something that's more reliable. They want something that's cheaper to run. So that's the main reasons why no one wants this car. But again, could point to reasons why it becomes more popular in the future for enthusiasts. Obviously, for enthusiasts, not for regular people, they're not going to even want to touch this car. Uh, cool. That pretty much wraps it up in terms of um, onward, save your money up and get a Bentley. Yeah, that's what I would do personally. Um, you know, if I had to get a Phaeton, I would get the W12. But if I were p picking between a Phaeton and a Bentley, I just, you know, Bentley's obviously probably going to be 
at the very least, you know, three times the price of a Phaeton. Um, so save your money and get a, get like a, you could either get, you know, a $10,000 Phaeton or you can get like a $30,000 Continental. They're probably going to be in the same league. The Phaeton actually will probably be a lot nicer than that. The Continental is probably going to spend a little bit more to get one that's in good condition, but it's going to be the same kind of parts and stuff. So if you can muster up that initial cost, the repair costs are pretty much equivalent. What are y'all talking about? It says it's like Mazda never succeeded in a luxury model. Worse than Mazda. The new cars are cool. Um, the CX-9 and the CX-5 straight six twin turbo. Yeah, the new Mazdas are cool. I actually kind of respect Mazda. They've been kind of doing their own thing. They're, they've been trying to get more and more luxurious as time goes on. And people like, you know, they, they don't really get enough support to really do it. But they're still trying. You know, they're releasing stuff. They got this the straight six, which is, you know, everyone's going straight six now for some reason. You see uh, Stellantis doing it with the Hurricane engine. You see Mazda doing it. You see Mercedes doing it with the E53 or the 53 AMG engines are all straight sixes. So it's like... I don't know why like it took them so long to figure out the straight sixes are like the superior six cylinder configuration. BMW figured that out a long time ago. Toyota did as well. So not really too sure why all the companies are hopping on it now. I think they um I don't know if it's like a packaging thing, like newer cars need that, you know, they they need a narrow I don't know, man. I have no idea why the straight six is becoming more popular as time goes on. I think it's simply because back in the day, like we knew the straight six was good, but a V8 is better. And now today we don't have that same, we don't have those same like regulations or lack of regulations, like as in back in the day. So the V8s are no longer a thing. So they're like, well, we might as well just optimize the next step down, which is going to be, you know, straight six. And I do believe the V6s were popular back in the day because they had the V8s. They could just knock off a couple cylinders and use a lot of the technology for the V6. But now they don't have the V8. They don't have anything to base it off of. So they figured... We might as well just start from scratch and make an actually good engine and a straight six is the way to go for a six cylinder and yeah super had them since the 90s yep bmw had them since the 70s bmw had a straight six since forever um yeah bmw is like known for the straight six but that pretty much wraps it up shout out to the six people in here if you haven't liked the video hit that like button it takes one second also subscribe to the channel i do uh i do body or body i do buyer's guides every single weekday so five days a week i am going to switch up the schedule when i get to 100 episodes in fact i thought i was going to reach 100 episodes by next friday but i think i'll be on 99 100 will be that next monday so um yeah around there we're going to start switching it up i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to do three buyer's guides per week i'm still going to go live five days a week but instead of having five buyer's guides i'm going to do three buyer's guides and then tuesday thursday i'm going to do more of a discussion something i think about you know i've thought about about the car market or about car brands or something car related um that's not specific to one car but maybe comparing two cars and comparing the market you know stuff like that a little bit more um discussion based less facts well i mean it's gonna be based on facts obviously but i mean it's more discussion based and less uh information like learning teaching base it's more of a discussion um so yeah in terms of packages, I'm just going to rehash this real quick. Get a 2005, 2006 car. If you get a V8, make sure it has the comfort and cold weather package. Just make sure it has that rear um, screen in the back. Also, make sure that it has a technology package with the parking sensors and power opening closed trunk because if V8 doesn't come with that standard. And if you get a W12, make sure you get the comfort package. It's going to be the same thing as the comfort and cold weather package. And then you can get the four-seater package if you want. However, you know it's going to be pretty rare, so just keep that in mind. In terms of cars, I don't even bring out this book. Tomorrow, oh wow, my camera froze, of course. Um, <laughs> let's see if it will, uh, I know you guys can still hear me, but I'm trying to just, uh, oh, there we go. It's about to reset. You got this camera. There we go. So for tomorrow, I'm going to be doing the BMW M340i. So the successor to the... 335 really they really uh i don't know how i feel about it audi did it first with the s line but then amg and m started to make you know the 43 amg the 53 amg or the m sport or whatever you want to call them the m with the three numbers instead of the one number so i don't know how i feel about those still even though they are really good cars i don't like how they bite off the m name uh but that's just me we're gonna go over the m340i tomorrow and show you guys exactly why that car is such an amazing car and why um, M340i is like mop up cars on the streets. Like not many people can afford an M3, but people can get the M340i and the M340i. And, you know, back in the day for me, it was a 335. That was the car that was like the street sleeper of the day. The M340i is doing the same thing and carrying the torch. 
But yeah, you missed the S5 the S551. I did like I thought that was a really good show in terms of the detail. Like I was able to go through everything. So yeah, definitely give that one a watch. Tons of good information in that one. But yeah, if you guys uh if you guys don't have any more questions for me today and you have already liked the videos and everything, um yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. I will see you guys tomorrow with the M340i, the BMW M340i. And as always, peace. Have a good one. Stay safe. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.